And since I realized I'm only doing the two, since I realized I'm only, I'm only doing the two pretzels, I decided to only do like four cups of water, and then I'm only going to put in, you know, a quarter cup of the baking soda. So. There we go. Now. This is actually where the magic happens. This, my friends, is what makes a pretzel a pretzel instead of just some bread. I'm going to take one of the pretzels and just drop it right in. And you see it flares up. I'm going to leave it in there for 30 to 40 seconds. And I'm going to hold it down too, or, I'm, or I can flip it over. Let's see. Depends on how. There we go. Flipped it, managed to flip it. Let that soak for 15, 20 seconds. And you're going to see it's going to come out of there a whole lot bigger than it went in. Same with the other one. Let that go for about 30 seconds. They'll float to the top, so you can either flip them if you want to, or just kind of, I'm using this, obviously, this wire basket just to kind of keep it submerged. But this really activates everything, and this is what gives it that outer brown crust and pretzel flavor. This makes the inside chewy and the outside a little crisp. Now, some people will keep these in there for a minute to a minute and a half. I think 30 to 40 seconds is really all you need. So that one's just about done. It is swelling up quite a bit bigger now than it went in. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to turn this stove off. I have no more use for this water, so I'm just going to let that cool down. These guys, though, get to go back and they get an egg wash on them. So back to the table. seems to have swollen swollen so much that the holes are locked up but that's okay now I take my little paintbrush my little egg wash I'm just gonna paint these with a little bit of egg this is again just egg yolk and water nothing special about it I didn't put any sugar didn't put any starch, 
just one egg yolk for these two. And I'm, I'm being a little lavish with it just because I got so much of it and only two pretzels. I've got six other pieces of dough, you remember, because I made I cut this piece, I cut this order into um, eight pretzels, and tomorrow I've got six people who are going to want to make pretzels. So there we go. That's that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this coarse salt. I'm just going to just kind of sprinkle it around on there. Don't need a lot of it. Just, you know, just some. All right. There we go. All right. Now my oven clicked on to uh, is at 450. So now my oven is at 450. It just beeped. So I'm going to take these pretzels and put them in on the rack at 450. So my oven just beeped. I'm going to take these pretzels, put them on the rack at 450 for about 12 to 16 minutes. And I'm keeping an eye on them. When they get dark, darkish golden brown, I'm going to pull them out. Baking that at baking those at four fifty. So, while those pretzels are in the oven for 12 to 16 minutes, whatever it takes, I'm now going to take some butter. That's probably a little bit too much, but you cannot, it's like bacon. You can never have too much butter, right? So I'm going to melt this, get the flour off of my butter, put the butter back in the fridge, and I'm going to nuke this in the microwave for 20 seconds. And when those pretzels come out, I'm going to cover them with this melted butter. Melted butter, just waiting for it.
those skin essentials mostly out of the need to help people with their skin. I think engage. Jeremy says that hearing the words grainy video makes his skin crawl and says that anyone who finds the evidence he's released in that way is misguided at best. Let, let's break that down. Okay, so um, these are multi-million dollar weapons platforms that are used to target, they're targeting pods with FLIR capability. So forward-looking infrared thermal capability. When you're looking at uh, some sort of propulsion system, it's showing you the heat signature. So if you have a jet that's, that's blowing far away, you're gonna see a trail of that heat. When you see a perfectly oval or egg-shaped object that's traversing without any kind of exhaust, and then by the way, it does appear to go into the water. That's what the Department of Defense suspected happened, and that's what they thought happened, and it went off radar, and they were not able to recover anything. So it is pretty sure that these things were transmedium, that they could operate underwater just as easily as in the air. So when people say like grainy, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's talked about it being some sort of like Instagram comparison of a photo. Clearly, maybe he doesn't know what FLIR is. I mean, that would be shocking, but he talked like he didn't know what FLIR was. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, not monochromatic, fuzzy, maybe video of something that looks like a Tic Tac. So the thermal imagery, we can't compare these to like Instagram photos, with like filters. These are straight out of Navy warfare, you know, platforms that then give us this visual data. There's no, it, there's no such thing as grain in it. Like you think of like old footage, you know, this is, it's a digital capture of thermal imagery. I know there's an education process. Look, I didn't know anything about UFOs until I started studying. It's a long road. It, it takes some time. There's stigma involved. There's the laugh factor involved. It takes some time. So we all got to catch each other up if we care. And that's Jeremy's mission, to catch people up by sharing evidence and testimony from those who aren't in a position to do so themselves. It's a mission he's dedicated his life to. I am most proud of the secrets I have rather than the secrets that I've put out because part of putting out secrets is, is people trusting that you can keep them until they're ready. What I've been able to put out was because I knew it was not in the, it, against national security, that it wouldn't get people in trouble. There is a, a whole lot of information that, that George Nash and I will be releasing as is legal and responsible. And look, not one piece of data is ever gonna be the, the, just the nail in the coffin, even after everything that I have been exposed to, that I have seen, that I should not have seen, that I should not have been privy to, that I have, should not have been shown. Even after that, all I have is more questions. I am more inspired by this mystery than ever. Because now, I, I, I don't know as much as I, I thought I knew when I started, man. Where are UFOs from? Who are operating them? What is their intent? I do not know the answers to the bigger questions, and I'm so excited to hopefully learn more. So I'll say to the best of my knowledge, we have actual physical hardware from an unknown origin, which is so far more advanced than what it is that we have fabricated with our material science up to date 2022, that it is astonishing to anybody that has had the ability to be part of these exploitation programs. So with that said, I think the next revelation for everybody, you know, every country in this world is going to be when we can see some of these materials and see how they're made. Because on a molecular level or an atomic level, these alloys are incredible. They're, they're perfectly atomically layered as if built in zero gravity. They're called metamaterials, the actual skins of these materials themselves. Are, are made of atoms that typically can't fuse together, and they're in such perfect, tiny little uh, layers that they were, they were somehow fabricated in a way that would be akin to atomic printing, which is not something that we can do now, but will be something that we can do in the future.
and more Americans are scared they might lose access to electricity for a long period of time. So if you're having any doubts about our Anyone who's ever stepped on board a boat has likely considered, if only briefly, what would happen if they fell off it. The terror of that thought, though, is usually washed away by knowing there'd be immediate help. A life ring would be thrown into the water. The boat would turn around. A rescue would happen. But what about if you're a lone sailor and you fall off your yacht in the middle of nowhere? A month ago, it happened to John Deere in shark-infested waters off Panama. And just how the Aussie adventurer survived the freak accident undoubtedly makes him the luckiest, unlucky bloke in the world. Melbourne may be John Deere's hometown, but strolling Chapel Street isn't exactly where he wanted to be right now. Nevertheless, his friends are glad as hell he's here. This is a reunion that some of them fear may never have happened. The 41-year-old has just returned home for the first time in three years after what was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime. And boy, does he have some stories to tell. It was like an hour after sunset. I felt like 5 p.m. had like an hour of sunset and about an hour after, after the sun went down. I felt something touch me and that was like, that was proper freaked out like a shark, you know, and I was screaming. John Deere's story of survival is truly remarkable. I'm going to try it, please. You get the feeling he quite enjoys telling it. I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm dead. Like, 100%, I was 100% convinced. And then there was that moment of, like, confronting him and telling him, like, wow, today's the day I've done. Like, I didn't think I'd go like this. This is it. You know what? Just, you've got to make this yourself. So just how did John survive this disaster? The solo sailor falling off his yacht, left floating in the middle of the ocean. His home drifting off into the distance, ending up smashed to pieces on rocks. It's as extraordinary as it is unfortunate. But for his friends, in some ways, this is not surprising. What was your reaction when you first found out what happened? It was equal measures, holy shit, and this is so John Deere. Like, if you were to write a headline um, at the start of his trip of how it's going to end, um, man swims through shark infested waters is probably pretty on brand for John. So, in parts, uh, concerned, but not surprised. Yeah, really concerned, um, but also know that he's going to have this yarn that's going to be pissing on people's ears for the next 20 or 30 years, so. <laughs> Um, he's got the story of his life. We're glad to have him back, of course, but he's also got the story of his life. If you're going to sail around the world, then there are a few better places to start than the Greek islands. It was on these breathtakingly blue waters that John Deere settled upon his boat for the voyage, a second-hand yacht by the name of Julieta. I guess my philosophy is like, Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I want to jam back my life with as much adventure as I can. So why not just try and live a life and see as much of the world as I can and try and live life to the fullest? A lot of people think, who has the time and the, the money to sail around the world? They must be loaded. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that you? Not at all. <laughs> no, quite the opposite, actually. Yeah. But the beauty of it, it was like, it was super, it was a, it was a cheap way to live. I think that was a huge part of the I think, like, I don't want to get old and look back and go, well, I worked a lot, you know? I'm like, man, life's for living, you know? And on a boat, it was incredible. Like, I, you know, I travelled for free with the wind. I ate for free from fishing from the ocean. I had solar panels, so I had free electricity. Um, and a free accommodation, you know, my house. It was not only my home, but, you know, daily or every how often, it converted into my transport as well. And it was great, yeah. John worked his way very slowly across the Mediterranean, Albania, followed by Italy, then island hopping his way around Spain. It's impossible not to be charmed by the stunning scenery he'd wake up to each day and the simplicity of life at sea. But it certainly had its challenges as well. At times, the conditions were dire, not just for sailing, but for cooking too. And then there was the boredom of being on your own. We're talking about living the dream. I guess this was you living your dream. Hundred percent. I loved it, man. It was it was incredible. Yeah, I love to jump into things I have no idea about. I feel alive, you know. Like the 
the, the working out part of things is what appeals to me. So I feel alive in throwing myself in the deep end. You know, part of the pun. After Europe, John headed down the west coast of Africa before making the potentially perilous journey across the Atlantic Ocean. Having survived that, he thought it would be smooth sailing up to Panama, where he was planning on heading through the canal and turning for Australia. But then, catastrophe struck. His journey literally took a massive misstep as he was casting out a line for food. Yeah, I've had about two hours sleep in the last 30 hours. I just checked my phone and uh, caught this fish. I'm like, wrapped, here we go, we're gonna have a good dinner tonight. And then took it off the line, chucked it in the bucket, you know, filled my bucket up, some salt water, I'll, I'll fill it that later. And yeah, just turned around to throw the line back in. I'm like, still got two hours left of passage, might catch another one, you know. Might have come into a place with a lot of fish. And yeah, I went to throw the line out and it happened in a split second, almost in, in, in slow motion as well. And yeah, I just put my foot wrong, and next minute, I'm in the water. I don't want to give you a PTSD, mate, but this is the exact same stern. Yep. Because you came off. Exactly the same. What well, happened? This is, yeah, just put my foot wrong, I guess. I just slipped, I remember, put, stepping down, my foot slipping out, and next minute, I was on my butt, and then I was in the water. Trying John to... knew instantly oh, his life was on the line. Yeah, that's, that's the part that's so slow, mate. It's like, no. And then underwater and then coming up and watching it go, watching it sail away. Hey guys, I'm going to share with you three things you need to start doing in Photoshop. I've created a Photoshop compositing toolkit that is jam-packed full of powerful, time-saving, and game-changing tools that you need to get started. It includes actions, presets, textures, overlays, foreground elements, tutorials on how to use them, and much more. My name is Rick Gardain, and as a graphic designer, I've worked with such... And then just off it went into the distance. Yeah. And then down at water level, watching full sails up and watching it motor away. Full steam ahead. Only a minute before going overboard, he checked his GPS, so knew his exact location, 17 kilometers from land. Many the calm waters had made John himself a little too calm and confident. Some might call him relaxed, some might call him reckless. Either way, all of a sudden, he was in too deep. For the first minute, I was like, didn't want to believe, like, this can't be reality. Am I dreaming? Is this real? Like, I can feel the water. I can see my boat. I'm pretty sure this is real. Okay, it is real. I'm like, I'm dead for sure. This is this is the day I died, 100%. I'm like, that's like 17 k's. There's no chance. Like, wow. I'm gonna. There's gonna be that, you know, that fateful lung full of water is, is coming. Are you wearing a life jacket? No, I should have should have had my life jacket, you know. And uh, but I mean, I crossed the Atlantic 19 days alone. I didn't have my life jacket on. I took calculated risks. But like I said, it was just, this was just bad luck. You know, just a slip that happened to put me into the water. But I had a t-shirt, literally had a t-shirt and shorts, that's all I had. And so the adrenaline surges, yep. and you think, I'm dead. Yeah, I, I kind of floated, I kind of treaded water for a moment, thinking, right, I'm gonna die. But I'm like, am I gonna just gonna float around and wait for that lung full of water? I'm like, I might as well start swimming. So, start swimming. So, what, what do you think the longest you've ever swam in your life is before that moment? I've been in places where I've been anchored 300 metres offshore, and I'm like, I'll take the dinghy or I'll take the paddleboard because I don't like my chance, and I'm like, get too tight. I'm like, it's a long way. There's no, ch like, there's no chance. Yeah, so 300 metres is a stretch for you normally, and all of a sudden, now you've got to swim 17 k's. Yeah. Yeah. John went overboard an hour before sunset. He made slow progress towards the coast, but as the sky above turned ominously dark, down below the surface, things all of a sudden got even more dangerous. I felt something start to, to bite. That was pure terror panic. I thought it was shark straight away.
After three years sailing halfway around the world, John Deere was living every solo yachtsman's worst nightmare. He'd gone overboard, and his boat had sailed off over the horizon. He was 17 kilometres off the coast of Panama, and little did he know at the time, the nearest town was called Cabo Tiburon. Translation, Cape of Sharks. You did have something living here, didn't you? About an hour after the sun went down, I felt something start to, to bite. And that was the only moment of like, that was pure terror panic. That was like punching and screaming in the water. I thought it was a shark straight away. What, just throwing haymakers? Yeah, totally, like screaming underwater, like, ah, get out, you know? But yeah, I think I realized very soon, I'm like, fatiguing me so much, I'm like, well, there's nothing I can do. If it is a shark, there's nothing I can do. I accept my fate, but it's not biting me yet, whatever it is, so I kept swimming. The stars were lighting up the night sky, and John used the direction of the moon for navigation. Slowly but surely, he made progress toward the Panamanian coastline. This is the crazy part. I mean, it was weirdly very serene. You know, once after the initial, okay, I'm dead, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna have a crack and start swimming. What's your swimming form like? Are we talking Thorpey with the freestyle? Are you a strong swimmer? I was swimming breaststroke. I did try freestyle a couple of times, but I couldn't see where I was going. I felt more tired actually doing that. I felt like I was expending a lot of energy. So, yeah, I ended up coming to a routine of swimming breaststroke until I was tired enough, and then I would turn on my back and swim backstroke. 17 cases is a damn long way. Did, do you break it down into little segments as you go? Yeah, I was, uh, that was something to kind of keep my mind occupied, like doing some sums, like, all right, I've swam 50 meters swimming pool before, you know, I'm like, right, every two laps is 100 meters, because I've got 17 K, so that's 340 laps, you know, I'm like, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, yeah, definitely something to keep, kind of keep my mind occupied. It worked. After 10 hours paddling with the help of strong currents, extraordinarily, the Australian adventurer made it to the temporary safety of the shoreline. As I was climbing up out of the water, that was the first time in 10 hours, this is my best guess how long I was swimming, I felt gravity, you know, I felt my weight, because you're kind of weightless in the water. And I remember, you know, the water surging, and I kind of grabbed on, and as the water went down, I'm like, oh, I feel heavy. Nearly slipped climbing up these rocks. I thought, like, wouldn't that be all right? I've just swam 17 k's, and then I'm like, you know, knock my head up, knock my head open, and die at the last minute. But managed to scramble up these sharp rocks, and that's when I felt, you know, I must have been going on so much adrenaline at that stage that it wore off, and my body just shut me down. So you've made it to the rocks. Such a huge effort to get there, and part of you probably thinks, I'm safe. Yeah. But you're not. Yeah. You've got to start all over again. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, okay, let's see what happens if the sun comes up. Maybe there's like a road, I can just walk into town. And then the sun came up and I looked up and I'm like, that's like impenetrable jungle. Like, even with a machete, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have got through it. And then I'm like, okay, I've got to get rid of it. It's not over yet. Drenched, dehydrated, sitting on a secluded rocky outcrop, John was desperate for help. So when he heard the distant hum of a boat's motor, for some reason, his Australian instincts kicked in. And so I screamed, Cooey! which is, you know, every <laughs> Aussie knows. If you're lost in the bush, you do, you know, it's cool. It's such an Aussie iconic thing. So on some outcrop in Panama, there's this bloke yelling, Cooey. Yeah, yeah, I gave some Cooey's, and I was, in a, I was in a bad spot, well, bad spot to be sighted at, at this stage. And the boat went out, so, you know, I gave my best calls out, and they didn't, they didn't see me. So I'm like, all right, I need to get up, I need to be more visible. So there are boats, at least I know there are, so there's some movement. I've seen one boat, potentially there's going to be more. John climbed to a higher vantage point and took his t-shirt off, attaching it to a tree branch, hoping to catch the eye of anyone else that sailed by. I'm getting real Tom Hanks in cars. <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah. And the second boat came, and I saw them in the distance. I'm like, okay, here we go, you know, I'm up high. And I waved my heart out and waved and cooey and, and yelled out. And they saw me, this is, the, this is the crazy part, they saw me and waved back and kept going. I'm like, no, no, stop, you know? This is a bad wave. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, what do you think, I'm here on holiday, topless, like, there's nothing around, there's no villages or anything, like,
like, like, oh no, but no, stop, you know. An excruciating hour dragged by before another boat came along. And this time, John was determined to make sure they didn't miss him. I gave him my best, you know, I'm in distress here. And then I saw that was a great moment. And then they, they turned, you know, towards me. And that's when, yeah, like I broke into tears. These guys come up and I'm like, help me, man. <laughs> like, I'm just shipwrecked, you know, like. What, what was the look on their face when they saw you? It was just some folks either crazy or desperate. Totally, yeah. Who is this guy? What is he doing here? What's this, what's this, you know, foreigner doing here on the rocks? I'm topless with my, with my flag, <laughs> just like barefoot, just trying to, yeah. Just trying to get a ride back and, yeah. I think they saw that desperation in my eyes. They're like, okay, this guy needs help. I'm like, please help me, man. Do you look at gorgeous girls like this? Or like this girl? And immediately you think to yourself, this girl is out of my league. She's unattainable. And the truth is, you know what? She is out of your league, but not for the reasons that you think. So let me explain. You see, if you're like most men, you might think incredibly hot women are out of your league because you're ugly, you are unattractive, you don't have a million dollars in your bank account, you're too skinny, or you're too fat, or you're too old, or you're too whatever, you're not six feet tall, you don't have six pack abs and bulging biceps, so on and so forth. It's natural that you think that way. After all, thousands of movies, TV shows, ads, magazines, and so on have fed you the wrong ideas about what women want for years. But believe it or not, the real reason why most normal everyday guys can't get those sexy top tier women is something completely different. Something that you never expect. Something no male dating expert or pickup guru is ever going to tell you about. The interesting part is once you deal with that real issue, that one thing, all of those gorgeous high quality girls suddenly fall into your league. Meaning, all of a sudden, beautiful women will begin to take an interest in you. They'll be more excited to chat with you and go out with you. They'll flirt with you and they'll be eager to date you and eventually sleep with you without you having to change anything about yourself. You'll see that simply putting yourself in front of the girl and being your natural everyday self is more than enough to start for attraction. Now at this point you're probably thinking, all right, enough foreplay, but what's this real issue and how do I deal with it? Well, you can find out right now because I've created a full free masterclass explaining exactly what the real issue is and how to fix it in just 60 days. So all you gotta do is click on the screen now to watch it. Watch. Against the odds, John had survived. He'd been rescued. But as he recovered from his ordeal in Panama City, he was about to face an eerie reminder of just how lucky he'd been. And man, I had like a physical reaction. My hair stood up on my arms. The coastline of Panama is spectacular and a destination for many keen sailors like John Deere. The Australian solo yachtsman unfortunately spent a lot longer here than he planned to after falling off his boat and having to swim 17 kilometres to safety. He knows luck was definitely on his side that night with favourable currents and warm ocean temperatures. I mean, the part that jumps out at me that I'm like, what? Is the 17k? It's like, mm. that is a huge swim. Yeah, that must have had current with me. Like, there's no. 17k's in 10 hours is like 1.7k's an hour. There's no. I'm, I'm no, you know, Olympic swimmer or. Jeez, I thought I'm a pretty uh, generally unfit guy. Must have had current. 100% had current with me. I think at that, at that speed, which was, yeah, so lucky. I mean, how lucky could you be on a number of fronts? You've got a current behind you. Perfectly still water. Yep. It's nice and warm. Yep. And there's no sharks in the Bay of Sharks. Totally, yeah. Interestingly, I, I prayed. I, I don't believe in God as such as in the religious God. I mean, yes, there's an energy, but I pray to the universe. I put it, I put some energy out there.
was it was luck. I don't know if that's destiny. I don't know if I believe in destiny either. But yeah, here I am. John was stranded in Panama for more than a week, waiting for a new passport, given from all his worldly possessions, and disappeared with his boat when it sailed off in the distance. But he did eventually find various parts of the yacht wrecked along the coastline, smashed to pieces, although somehow the toilet still seemed fine, and an enterprising local made the most of his outboard motor. Funnily enough, John killed some time over there by watching reruns of 60 Minutes and happened upon one particular story that struck a chord. I was in Panama, I ended up watching a 60 Minutes story about a guy up north in Australia in 1770 and it was a trawler and these guys and so tragic that six of his mates died and his boat had returned. But I'm watching his story, right? He's explaining it and I, my heart's beating out of my chest listening to someone else's story. And, um, and then he starts talking about when he was swimming and man, I had a, like a physical reaction. My hair stood up on my arms and it was, it was fascinating because it was so similar to my story. Was hearing someone else's story was the first time I was able to understand how everyone felt about my story. And I just, just like a rat. And then I surfaced up out of the water. And I just go, the biggest roar of adrenaline. The man John's talking about is Reuben McDonald, who was on a fishing boat that overturned nine kilometers off the Queensland coast in 2017. Six of his mates were trapped on board and lost their lives. 